Hello and welcome to episode 138 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stock. I'm James Whittingham. This week, several companies are throwing to the towel on full self-driving. But please, keep your hands on the wheel and your attention on the road as you listen to this podcast. The state of South Dakota now produces more electricity from wind than any other source. Must be the hot air coming from Mount Rushmore, am I right? No, UN Chief Antonio Guterres says he's says we are on the highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. Again, please keep your hands on the wheel and your attention on the road as you listen to this podcast. In France, the government has ordered that all parking lots must be covered by solar panels. All because President Emmanuel Macron can't get the top back up on his convertible Renault. All that and so much more on this edition of The Clean Energy Show. And also this week, Brian, uh, why a switch in power in the United States Congress, which is voting as we speak, as we record this, won't kill Biden's Inflation Reduction Act. But uh, a change in government in Canada actually would be a problem for uh, us north of the border uh, because, well, I'll get to that later. And I'll also have a bit of an update live from COP27, sort of. And what's new with you? How was your trip to Saskatoon? Because last week you were heading north two and a half hours in the snowy Canadian winter to get your Tesla fixes. That's the closest uh, Tesla service center to you. Yeah, that's right. So um, the heater's not been working right and uh, didn't seem to be working quite right last winter, but kind of not enough to generate an error message. But now I had an error message, so they seem to know what to do to fix it. So drove up to Saskatoon, where the closest service center is. And yeah, they replaced the whole heater. That's what they did. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. But it's under warranty, so it's fine. Oh, Joe, everything's fine, isn't it? <laughs> everything's fine. It's everything's under... What does the warranty end, let me ask you? Because it has, as we pointed out a couple of weeks ago, two and a half years, a quarter decade. Are you getting close to yeah. the point where this is going to start killing you in the wallet or what? I don't recall when it ends, but I think it might say specs and warranty. It says in the app somewhere. Yeah, here in the app, the Tesla app, uh, basic vehicle limited warranty expires in March 2024 or 80,000 kilometers. The battery... 2028 or 160 and the drive unit 2028 or 160,000 kilometers as well. So, uh, yeah, a couple more years to go on the, on the basic warranty. Uh, okay. I see 18 months in the basic warranty. This could be a different discussion in the future. Okay. What was it? Was it the PTC heater, the resistive heater or was, yeah. you know, you don't have a heat pump. So that's what it was. No heat pump. So the resistive heater, yeah, for some reason, um, they were sure about they, that. They were pretty sure by the time I got there, because they have all the data from the car, like everything in the car is digitized and they can see all the data from my car. So as I dropped it off, they said, yeah, it's probably the whole heater needs to be replaced. And they were prepared to do that. And at the same time too, there was a, there's been a recall for the trunk lid um, harness or something. It's, I think it's to do with the 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 cables that go to the, yeah, to the camera in the back. So um, that they did that at the same time and, uh, it took about, uh, like four hours for them to do it. Is that right? Time. Where you had an appointment at 8 a.m. and they went right at it and started working yep. on it. Yep. Called me around, uh, 1130. And they had the part, which is good. Again, I assume because they had all the data, they, you know, could order the parts ahead of time, you know, that they, they would need. That's nice. Um, yeah. And they gave me a loaner car, which I drove around, um, Saskatoon for a while and, uh, yeah, it got back before there was another blizzard. What was that? A couple of days later, our yeah. second blizzard of the year, which is not technically a blizzard. No, uh, against Environment Canada, against your wishes, call it a blizzard. They're not calling it a blizzard, but boy, was it a blizzard! Oh, it was crazy. Another nasty, nasty one, and I think we were the epicenter this time. Uh, last time it was uh, Moose Jaw, but um, oof, yeah, really nasty. Tons of snow. Um, yeah, crazy out there. Uh, how was your trip back? Was it okay? And, and the heater was, was all hot. How was it there though, without the heater? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, I did, uh, like it was below zero. So I did, um, I put on my parka. <laughs> so you didn't have and heat? I, there was a little bit of heat, not, not enough. And the, the heated seat was still working. Uh, but with the parka on, it, it was fine. Here's what I'm thinking. And that is, um, uh, 
your some the newer cars have a heat pump. Yeah, is that right? right? Newer Teslas have a heat pump instead of a resistive. Heat so pump. they don't have both then, eh? I don't think so. No, you'd think that they might need one as a backup, but but maybe that the car generates enough heat that. Oh yeah, so yeah, it's taking heat from the motor, or it's taking heat from the from the battery the inverter, or and I there's think, different. But, there's a know, loop of different things that heat up when you're yeah, running an electric car. But we car. do know there has been problems with some of the heat pumps as well in in extreme cold. And it's, it's yeah. You know, is it been the heat pump itself or something related to the heat pump? Anyway, um, that's interesting because I just, you didn't get a price on what that would be. They didn't show the invoice of what that repair would cost. Uh, no, they didn't. Just said zero. I'd be interested to know. I guess you could look it up online, what somebody, what somebody else did. Uh, mm -hmm. we'll talk more about these sort of thing in future months. Um, so anything else you went up, you, you managed, your feet didn't get cold. Yeah, no, it was a little bit chilly, but it wasn't too bad. Um, and. Was it the most unpleasant trip you've had? Because you were cold? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, it's, but w I've got a really, really warm parka. So it, it felt almost normal with that on, I, you know, the heat can radiate up from the, the heated seat and yeah. fill the parka. But. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that's going on with me is, uh, they started shooting a TV show across the street from me here in the, uh, in the neighborhood. Really? Well, let's get to James's TV corner. Uh, well, that's, you know, that's happened before, hasn't it? What is it I about the, 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 across the street? Cause nobody, there used to be somebody of relevance who lived there, who was connected to the film industry. Yeah. But not they're anymore. gone now. And, and it's, it's their house that's being rented for this. But how is, our, that's our, a weird coincidence though. Uh, yeah. And our, our good friend Jay is working on the shoot. So I've run into him out there on the street. Wow. I bet he doesn't know we're talking about him. No, probably not. I assume he doesn't listen to the podcast. No, he wouldn't. He's, a, he's an old man. I don't think he oh, knows Oh, he's an angry is. old man, Brian. An angry, angry <laughs> old man who's actually six months younger than me. But yes, he's... <laughs> <laughs> so he's working at Winter and there's a TV show shooting across the street from you. Mm -hmm. Any uh, any stories? Um, any any inconvenience really. to you? Are you starting to understand why film sets uh, are annoying? Or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, I think Jay would prefer to be shooting in a soundstage where there's a lot more room for everybody and it's a lot more comfortable. Sure. Because, of course, you know, it's a blizzard. Remember? Why couldn't it and be a James Cameron green screen affair, you know? That's, yeah. That's what you want to work exactly. on. Exactly. But, yeah, no, there's a lot of traffic on the street, lots of lots of cars parked on our streets. Um but it's fine. You know, I back in the day when I was a kid, I did a couple shows outside. It's horrible. Even in the yeah. fall when it's warmer than this, it's yeah. To spend fourteen hours outside is just it's not yeah. good. Yeah. I mean they're shooting really inside the house, but there's so many crew people you gotta come and they go. kinda have to spill out into the cars and into the, the yard and everything. So was there somebody blocking traffic? Uh no, no one closing off the traffic. Okay, because so that'd far. be annoying. You're coming home, you gotta pee. And some, yeah. some little uh, film student has a stop sign and says, no, you can't. Um, so something weird happened to me on Sunday. I was minding my own business watching uh, TV. The NFL. We were snowed in. It was a blizzard, as you say, right? Yeah. I couldn't mm -hmm. do anything. So it was yep. my, my son's home from college, and he took a shower. And I got to thinking, what is that cable cam on football games called? What is the brand name for that? Because I started thinking okay. about that. And uh, so I Googled it, and it's called a Skycam. And then that took me to the Wikipedia page of, of the Skycam. And then I found out that the Skycam company was bought by this company, then bought by that company, and then it was bought by uh, the person my son hates most in the world, which is Stan Kroenke, the owner of um, the Arsenal Football Club and the, and the Denver Broncos and a bunch of other things. He's a bad, uh -huh. bad man, according to mm -hmm. people who support the team. And then I, I was gravitated towards a section that said incidents, you know, because of course, well, that's sexy. I'm going to go there. There was three yep. incidents, Brian, yep. one in like 1981 when they first invented, and by the way, it was invented by the same person who invented the Steadicam. Yeah. Um, so that person who I'm assuming is rich now. Yeah. So this is a camera that's on a giant cable that runs Multiple across the cables. stadium. 
So a, a couple of cables so it can fly uh, over the players during a, a football game with a camera. I believe it's like a big X of cables so it can go yeah. in three dimensions back and forth and just above the helmets of the... You see them, you may not notice them. Uh, I don't think anybody who's paying attention notices them. Anyway, there was one incident at a, college, a, a small college football game back in the 80s when it was first came out. There was an incident in like 25 years ago and the third incident was an hour before I read it. <laughs> an hour before I read it, it was a game that I that we didn't have here. It was the New York Jets game, and apparently the game was delayed by an hour because the sky cam fell from the. I just thought that was weird, you know, like it just fell. You're reading three incidents in history and going, "Ooh, oh, this was an hour ago. The third one was an hour ago." And, and somebody had updated the. So, Wikipedia of course they did, that. Brian, because Wikipedia. <laughs> that's it's all about updating quickly. Um, when we die, you know, we'll be, the people, our, our family won't know before Wikipedia knows, like it'll be updated instantly. Yeah. Well, you know, there's no entry about me on Wikipedia. So oh, there will be by then. To write one. Yeah, me please. too. I've been <laughs> begging people to write one for years. I keep writing it myself <laughs> and they reject it. Even though I have many awards <laughs> and accolades. You're not allowed to do that. And yeah, last night... Uh, we, my, my partner had a grocery store order far away and we went to, um, the East end of town to pick up groceries cause she ordered it in advance before the blizzard without checking yeah. the weather. It was a harrowing affair and we decided to use her coupons for Carl's Jr., <laughs> which she yeah. never go to, but yeah. we thought that'd be exotic someplace we haven't been. Let's go there and try this coupon out. Mm -hmm. and we got there and ordered and it all went smoothly and we got to the drive through window and there was this carload of teenagers in front of us who had been stuck there for an hour. And no one at the drive through told us anything, but the car in front of us was stuck right at the window for an hour. So we, we had the car that my uh, partner uses and many, many years ago, we went to the grocery store chain, Superstore. And uh, they had clearance, these um, pieces of rectangular plastic that are grippy that you put under your wheel. They're like a little tread of plastic that's really pointy. Yeah, so it's something you, you keep in the trunk, and if you get stuck in the snow, you put them under your wheels. Never used them. Cost about 50 cents. Like they were, you know, yeah. discounted from like 12 bucks to 50 cents. Never used them, but she had them in the car, put one under the front wheel, cut them out of there in a second. And they threw wow. $20 at me, which I refused, of course. But they were so <laughs> thankful to get out that they didn't think they ever would. And of course, it's embarrassing because you're blocking, you know, you know, a fat guy from getting his burger behind you. And that's no good. So, yeah, we got them out instantly, uh, mm -hmm. which was funny as hell. Good deed of the week. Sure. Now. Let's get on to some discussions of past stories because I wanted to talk about um, the Energy Viz Climate Podcast. Okay, this is my namesake, Ed Whittingham. He calls himself. Yeah. I call myself Whittingham. He calls himself Whittingham. He's from Alberta. It's 90% chance we're cousins, okay? I haven't worked mm -hmm. it out yet, but two people. Sure. There's like six Whittinghams in Canada and apparently yeah. two of them fell into clean energy somehow. I don't know what you... But uh, whose podcast is more popular? That's what I want to know. Uh, well, he's a big deal because <laughs> he's worked for... He's been in the news like for working for governments as a consultant. So okay. uh, he would have a lot of... Uh, pol like this is a this is not the same kind of podcast our people necessarily listen to because it's it's in the weeds. It's, it's in sure. policy. There's a lot of policy for people who work in the industry. And it's a huge... Sounds like a snooze. <laughs> well, uh, I do listen to it. And uh, they had Catherine Hamilton on, who used to uh, host the uh, the Clean Energy Gang, or the Energy Gang podcast. Uh, now she's gone off to other things, and I think she worked for the U.S. government for a while. Uh, she's from the States, of course, and she's a clean energy expert and has got decades of uh, clean tech and policy in D.C., uh, and she was talking about the U.S. midterms, and I was worried. You know, I've said before on the show that I'm worried about what's going to happen when, because it's probably going to change. Power is going to change in one way or another in Washington, whether it's now or later. It always changes. Yeah. Uh, how safe is the clean, you know, the the big Biden thing? Is that going to be reversed? Because they're evil. They they reverse things. They don't believe in climate change at all. They think it's a hoax. Sure. So I just thought she had a really interesting answer to that. I'll play for you now.
So I don't think that that shift will have a direct impact yet on the climate goals. It will certainly prevent anything additional from happening. And the Cong- U.S. Congress holds the purse strings for the federal government. So just on appropriating funds to keep the government going, that will have an impact. But the pieces that are in IRA are pretty strong. I mean, they are tax credits unless they were to completely rewrite the tax code. And I'll give you a little secret. When you give somebody something, don't ever try to take it away. So you're going to have all of these people taking advantage of credits. And in fact, manufacturers are already moving into states that are heavily Republican states. And the last thing they want is those tax credits to go away. And in fact, during the Trump administration, they never put on the table rolling back solar and wind tax credits. They just didn't because they knew that was a losing proposition for them. Yeah, I didn't realize uh, that even during Trump, they didn't roll back very much, did they, as far as climate goes? Because, you know, Hmm. um, business people were investing, and that's the thing. Now, in Canada, it's a different story. What they call it, and they refer to it as a runway in the States, Uh, solar and wind have a 10-year runway that it's guaranteed that if you invest, you can keep investing and it'll still work out. You're not wasting your investment. You need to give assurances and security to people to make these investments because that's what the clean energy transition is. It's largely investing. So, but in Canada, we don't have that. So, you know, our government is a minority parliamentarian government that may switch at 2025, will probably. I mean, the governments don't last forever around here either. Um, And that government hardly wants to get rid of carbon taxes and doesn't seem to legitimately, you know, believe in climate change either. Uh, They're not that far off from the Republicans. So, but yeah, apparently their Canadian government is uh, working on making that so that it's a guaranteed thing. Because investors are already threatening. They might be grandstanding, but they're threatening their lobbies going to the States because, you know, that's where the guarantee is. So I don't know. No. And there's even definitely companies worried about doing business in places like Alberta because of the sort of backwards looking uh, energy policy that they have there. If you you know, you if you're a giant business, giant international business, you're going to think twice, uh, setting up a business in a place that is uh, denying climate change. And we were talking about Carlos Ghosn last week, the, uh, former, uh, chairman of uh, Nissan, who yeah. oversaw the implementation of the Nissan Leaf, the first mass-produced electric car, which I happen to own, a 10-year-old version of that. And I, uh, <laughs> there's actually a, a Netflix documentary that just came out a week ago as we were talking about that. Oh, fantastic. Well, it, I don't know that it is fantastic. I'm not reviewing it. I'm not endorsing it. It's called Fugitive, The Curious Case of Carlos Ghosn. And... I, I watched a bit of it. It's a lot of talking heads, um, you know, but it's interesting because it's kind yeah. of like a like a heist movie, right? Because he's accused yeah. of stealing millions from the car company he led. He was arrested in Japan and smuggled out of the country by two Americans in a storage chest who, coincidentally, were also just convicted this week. As soon as I brought it up, things start happening, Brian. <laughs> wow. Okay, well, I... I think I'll check that out. That sounds, uh, it's always was an interesting story just because of that one detail (laughs) that he had to uh, (laughs) escape the country. in a Yeah. Oh, we have some breaking news. The 8 billionth human being is about to be born in the world. We go now to Antonio Guterres, the head of the United Nations. The 8 billionth member of our human family is born. How will we answer when baby 8 billion is old enough to ask? What did you do for our world and for our planet when you had the chance? After President Trump announced that America would withdraw from the Paris Climate Change Accord, Elon Musk immediately announced he would quit presidential business councils. We are in the fight of our lives and we are losing. Greenhouse gas emissions keep growing. Global temperatures keep rising, and our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. Twitter owner Elon Musk has told his followers on the platform to vote for a Republican Congress Tuesday. Musk tweeted, quote, to independent-minded voters, shared power curbs the worst excesses of both parties. 
global warming, which a lot of people think is a hoax. The earth will end only when God declares it's time to be over. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. This is the Clean Energy Show with Brian Stockton and James Whittingham. Okay, so a quick story here from South Dakota. Now, we often talk about North Dakota here on the show because we're just above In many ways, Brian, in many ways above it. Saskatchewan. Yeah, in many ways. I love North Dakota, home of the Fargo Film Festival, home of the Fargo Theater. Anyway, um, South Dakota, which is just below North Dakota, um, it is now getting most of its electricity from wind. They previously had... um, Hydroelectric was the uh, the biggest source, but now 52% is coming from uh, wind turbines uh, in the province there. So congratulations. And to what South I say Dakota. to that initially is, why not us, Brian? Why not us? I wonder what led that yeah, we, to happen. Like what, you know, was it private investment? Because there was, you know, we have a utility owned, ut- yeah, sorry, a government owned utility here. Uh, was it the private sector that, you know, saw cheap electricity that drove the investment in that? What sparked that? Because South Dakota is not, you know, in in the day and age of accusing everything green as being on one side of the political spectrum and therefore the enemy, uh, the other, then I'm surprised that a state like South Dakota was able to do something like that. Yeah, and South Dakota and North Dakota both tend to be uh, conservative-leaning states. So, um, you know, it, uh, it is slightly surprising, but, um, as we know, it's a great idea. So, uh, we have very similar wind profile here in our province, um, and a little bit of wind power, but it, it really needs you to know, be, uh, cranked. It's interesting politically, um, when I was in Fargo with you that I was asking, cause that was just when Trump was becoming a thing and I was trying to get a Trump sign to bring home as a was asking around for one. Uh, yes. they, they were all lefties saying, there. apologizing for their country. Uh, but it, it just goes <laughs> to show that even in very right wing states, uh, you have pockets of people who are, you know, not everybody's yeah. going to be one way or the other. There's always pockets, even in the most extreme leaning states. So, and yeah, Fargo, it's, is a college town. They've got like yeah. I think three universities in Fargo or Fargo yeah. Moorhead. And of course, yeah, people involved in the film festival, um, I guess tend to be people in the arts, more left leaning, but, um, you know, as a whole. And uh, my son always points places. out that Wyoming has Casper, which is also a small college town. Um, cause we've been through Wyoming a few times and I've been shaken by some of the images that I've seen there and there's lots of bad yeah. things to look at and signs and, and messages, but yeah, Casper, which is a town we did go to was a cool little, it was like a Fargo of Wyoming. It was kind of like a, a cool little college town with a nice Taco Bell, if I may add. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And we, you know, I wanted to go there for the eclipse, the total eclipse of the sun, that, that was the closest uh, to us was Casper, Wyoming. And, but, you know, we oh, had just, I think we had just done a, a six week vacation in the mountains with our camper and, uh, I couldn't convince my partner to do it. I regret that ever since because, you know, it would have been a one day trip to see something remarkable. No. And I thought about driving, uh, to Calgary or Winnipeg to see Kate Beaton, author of the Ducks graphic novel, which I was, uh, plugging on the show, but blizzards, blizzards are bad. Are you never know bad. this time of year, whether when you're where we live in Western Canada, where you're going to get bad weather and certainly any mountain pass, um, anytime you, like even the, the Sierra Nevada yeah. mountains are getting a, you know, killed with a whole whack of, of snow. Um, uh, you know, I've got a story I wanted to talk about. Um, it's been, there's a, I guess a few companies, at least a couple in the last week or so that have dropped plans, like Ford has announced that it has dropped plans uh, for a level three uh, driver assistance, which would lead them to robo taxis. And they're going to focus on level two just for the consumer rather than as a business. So that's, that's been a, mm-hmm. a big shift. Mercedes is kind of doing the same. Um, they say robo taxis are no longer a goal. We thought that in 2016 or 17, and that's kind of when the neural net sort of became a thing. And and they thought, well, everything's going to be solved quickly. But now they're backing off of that. 
and they they thought they could solve the robo taxi problem quite quickly, and so did certain CEOs who are now social media magnates. But committing to both a ride hailing solution and a passenger driven assistance solution was expensive. So they thought they just concentrated on the one the, the make people because people are demanding it now. You know, they're demanding basically the different versions of autopilot for different cars the, the, just to drive itself on the highway. Uh, how mm -hmm. was your autopilot, by the way, in wintertime? How is it doing on actual highways? Yeah, generally, generally really good. It, it can kind of sense generally okay. through the snow. Well, self-driving taxis that operate all day, every day in all kinds of weather have been a dream for many for decades. Uh, you know, including the, uh, one of the Google people who started their anonymous autonomous program, a Waymo, he, uh, yeah. So now they're, he's programming trucks to operate within the confines of industrial sites only, uh, one of these guys. And he says the foreseeable future, that's as much of the complexity as any driverless vehicle will be able to handle in his opinion. Um, he says, forget about the profits, the combined revenue of all the robo taxi, robo truck companies is, uh, it's not a lot right now. It's probably, you know, yeah. more like zero. So, uh, I, you know, um, our friend of the show, um, Markham Hislap, who, um, is one province over from us or two provinces over, but from where we live, he's got a, um, a YouTube show called energy, energy media, and he also has a podcast from time to time. And he has a, a guest on from Guidehouse Insights, who's an automotive engineer and EV analyst. His name is Abdul Samid, and he's somebody that I go to for, you know, EV information and, and sort of market uh, knowledge like that. And uh, boy, he's got um, some cold water to throw on the robo taxi thing. So I got some clips from him. This is him talking about uh, that it's going to be a while before someone solves this. To, to be at the point where you can really start to scale it up dramatically and, you know, get to a, a level of a number of vehicles on the road where you can start to build a really viable business out of it, it's probably closer to eight to 10 years, uh, you know, closer towards the end of this decade than where we are today. And again, this is Markham Hisop's uh, YouTube show, Energy Media. I'll have a link to it in the show notes uh, so we can borrow from him without guilt. Um, and also, uh, <laughs> he's talking about how AI sort of plateaued what I was just talking about, the newer net, uh, near net, newer net, neuron net development in early 2010s was, you know, something that people thought would would move fast, but apparently he sees a, a big plateau happening and slowing down. You know, we had that big advancement in the middle part of the last decade, and that suddenly moved things forward very quickly, but then it plateaued. And it's been climbing very, very slowly ever since it hit that plateau. And so that's that's why it's it's hard to predict, you know, when we'll we'll get to that stage where these systems are at least as good consistently as good as or better than humans. Now, there's been a Department of Justice investigation into Musk over full self-driving claims, uh, according to Reuters, and um, prosecutors in Washington and San Francisco are examining whether Tesla misled customers. I hear when you look at, um, you know, sort of uh, um, onstage discussions from people in this space, they're really bad mouth Tesla. Now you could take that with a grain of salt and say it's envy or, you know, I don't believe in their approach, but you know, Tesla's always proving people wrong. Anyway, this is his opinion, uh, his contrary opinion on the Tesla approach, and he doesn't think much of it. There are some fundamental flaws in the Tesla approach, you know, relying on cameras only, uh, and particularly, you know, because of the way they've configured the cameras where you don't have any stereoscopic imaging. So you can do uh, parallax, imaging, you know, to get some accurate distance measurement. Tesla is relying entirely on AI inference to try to measure distance to objects, which is an inherently flawed approach. The system that they have devised is not really capable of robust automated driving and probably never will be. Between the name and what Elon Musk has consistently said for the last six years, since October of 2016, when they launched Autopilot version two, and he started his presentation with starting today, all vehicles rolling out of the Tesla factory have all the hardware they need to get to level five autonomy, which was a lie then, and it's a lie today. He's a, he's a pinch angry, <laughs> I think. <laughs> 
which is something that that's sort of a toad that I hear of these things. But yeah, uh, well, we'll see. But you know, Tesla's um, future is high re highly reliant on that's one big aspect of it. It's not just selling yeah, cars. Yeah, well, I suspect it? that they probably wouldn't do the same thing now. So that's back in 2016, and uh, Tesla was not in a profitable position back then. So they started selling full self-driving, I think partly just as a way to get revenue into the company, you know, a future promise of a future feature. Um, since then, they've become very profitable and very stable. So if they were starting this program now, I don't think they would be selling this feature for the future at, you know, $10,000, $20,000. Um, but yeah, I suspect back then they just wanted the cash flow. And, you know, another problem that I've seen come up is people like you who have the full self-driving beta but aren't yeah. using it. So apparently that's a bit of an issue because it's kind of annoying, right? It turns off and you think, well, I'll just just drive normally for now. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of, I don't know, I, I've got better things to do. <laughs> sure, you do, yeah. even in your retirement. But, you know, th this has become an issue because they're getting less data. And they need more data, which is maybe one of the reasons why they're trying to roll it out to even people yeah, with bad but driving could they scores. possibly even crunch all the data that they're getting? As a almost on the inside observer, I, I have a friend who owns a Tesla. That's you. Uh, I I'm amazed at how the promises keep coming that it's later this year, end of the year, next year. And, you know, year after year, it's always there. And But watching the progress of auto full self-driving beta, uh, it does seem to be a slow crawl. Like, it's yeah. not nothing. I mean, something could happen where, you know, it's everything comes together. I don't know everything about it to comment. And, you know, maybe they'll solve something that, uh, you know, puts everything together and suddenly it makes a giant leap forward. But... Right now, and we'll see. We'll see because we, we're six months away from testing your car again on the same route, and we'll see how it does. And we had a rainy day last year, so it wasn't perfect, but yeah. yeah. Anyway, France. Yeah. France is doing something quite unusual. Yeah. Even for so France. There is new legislation that was approved this week that requires all parking lots in France with spaces for at least 80 vehicles. This is both existing and new parking lots be covered by solar panels. So I, this is great. So anything that has an 80 vehicle parking lot. Yeah. Uh, what would that be? Yeah, we have be a strip mall. Yeah, a strip mall I would have so. that. We have quite a few kind of small parking lots in our city, I think, that wouldn't qualify. But um, well, even a big hotel, Brian, would have eighty spots, yeah, wouldn't right. it? I mean, if you have eighty rooms, you'd have eighty spots. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it just makes sense. Like this is kind of schools, maybe. Yeah, schools. This is space that um, it's just there, and if we put solar panels on it, it will keep the rain off the cars and uh, produce electricity. It's a, it's a nice uh, incentive. So this, you have to do this. Yeah, this is the law. Um, so according to the government, the potential of the me this measure could reach up to 11 gigawatts, or the equivalent of the power of 10 nuclear reactors at, you know, the peak. midday yeah. <laughs> on a sunny day So in the summer. So that's interesting. That's a lot of power just from parking lots. No, and we have, we've had stories in the past about covering canals, you know, in like in California, I might as well cover the canals. There's just all this space that, that we have that could have a double use, and uh, parking lots is one of them. You know, though, I, I wonder what the business model is for this, what what the payback is. I don't know what French France's uh, tariff system is for, you know, if they have any money for, you know, just putting out the panels or the feed-in of the electricity to the grid, how they pay and what the payback period is. But let's say that it's reasonable uh, you would have customers that would be pretty happy to be parking under a structure, mm -hmm. you know, an outdoor structure that, um, you know, shaded you, perhaps shield you from precipitation. And uh, you could sit and, and wait for uh, your spousal unit to shop and you wouldn't cook in the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, you would be shaded and, and comfortable. No, we on the have other hand. a real problem here of, uh, you know, we have very hot sun in the summertime, so... Uh, always better to get a parking spot with shade. Um, I thought this was interesting. So it's the bigger 
parking lots that are going to have to do this first. Uh, car parks with 400 spaces or more um, have about three years to comply, and then the smaller parking lots get uh, about five years to comply. So this isn't just new construction. This is existing, existing construction? Existing parking lots. So, yeah. Oh, that is a big deal. My yeah. goodness. No, and if you think of some of the, like, think of a, uh, you know, I, I don't know if they have Walmart in France, but... Um, Let's hope not. You think of like around <laughs> they say, here. They must be too good for Walmart. <laughs> Le Walmart. Um, <laughs> the giant parking lots that we have for places like Walmart or, you know, shopping malls. Man, that'd be a lot of solar panels. Uh, yeah. You know, I've been thinking about what we'll use. Because um, we, we, when we drove, the grocery store that we went to last night at the Blizzard actually has a bunch of stuff built on the outside of what used to be a parking lot. Mm -hmm. There's a, actually an office building there. Yeah. They, with it, it used to be a restaurants and retail. Lot, but they keep adding businesses to it. Yeah. And that confused me because it's hard to find now. It's yeah. easy to find a store at the end of a giant parking lot that's 10 miles away. <laughs> but... Yeah. Um, you know, they have Walmarts in China, right? Oh, do they? Um, yeah, they do. Wow. Uh, there's no French Walmart in France. So I just uh, Googled that. Okay. Of course, it would. there's a French Disneyland, but there's no French Walmart. It's <laughs> right, basically yeah. the same thing. Euro Disney. Basically the same thing. Um, I just had to, I had to look that up. That's, uh, you know... Uh, when we when we do go to a robo taxi future, we're going to need less parking spaces, right? Yeah. So the way I envision it is, say, I've got a, a shopping mall close to me, and it's got lots of parking spaces, yeah. and I think that what they could say is, well, you know, part of this shopping mall can be designated for robo taxis, because you know robo taxis will go mostly at the peak of when people get on and off work and on and off school, mm -hmm. it's just like rush hour. Yeah. But for the rest of the day, they'll have to sit somewhere. They'll need somewhere to hang out. And they'll need to go somewhere where they can charge and where they can, somewhere nearby yeah. different areas of town. I don't know where that's going to be. Yeah, plus I imagine it'll be like the movie Cars and they'll want to hang around together and chat. Sure, they'll party. <laughs> have social issues and things like that. It'll, of course it'll be like that. Uh, but at the same time, I'm wondering if we'll need less well, I mean, that's what Tony Seba says. We'll need less parking lots. And there's, you know, a significant amount of Los Angeles that is nothing but parking lots. Mm -hmm. And that's that's also a heat, uh, you know, gainer for it, it, it increases the urban um, island, uh, heat island of uh, cities is yeah. parking lots. Well, so. hopefully we can densify all of our cities and just start building more building and housing, uh, you know, on all these parking lots we're not going to need. Right. And that'll be... An exciting future. Plus, I'll get driven right to the door. Um, and hopefully some sort of device will lift me up and put me on an automated cart that will drive me around. Yeah. Because uh, walking is just too much of a chore uh, in the future, I think. Uh, so Porsche has made 100,000 cars? 911s? What have they made 100,000 of, this Brian? This is the Porsche Taycan electric car. They've now produced 100,000 of this car. So... It's been um, a pretty big success for Porsche. These are in demand. They are selling more of these than the 911, which is kind of the marquee car for Porsche. Um, what I didn't know is it's, you know, it's not a huge company. This is really a niche player. So um, they delivered just over 300,000 vehicles last year. So they're a small car company, niche and, of course, very expensive. What did Tesla deliver? Uh, like one and a half million, was it? Yeah, that's, and they're just getting going. Just getting started. This is without the two new factories that just went up. This yeah, just so they one. delivered just over 300,000 vehicles total, and 41,000 of them were the all-electric uh, Taycan. So they have plans to electrify more of their lineup, but um, like a lot of things, it's it's been a little bit delayed. The Macan was the next one that they were going to um, electrify and so far they haven't managed to do that, but, um, yeah, I, it's, um, they've been surprised by that, haven't they? I mean, I think they've been overwhelmed by demand, but they've also stepped up to meet that demand, which yeah. is great too. But it really does make sense if you're someone who's interested in a Porsche, you're interested in performance driving. And as we know, electric makes for fantastic performance driving. 
And if you're wealthy, and if you're wealthy, then you want to impress your wealthy green friends and um, drive. Uh, well, you know, there's nothing more luxurious though yeah. than driving quiet. So I love that. I don't know. Would that impress your green friends? The a Porsche Taycan. It seems yeah, some of them a little excessive. <laughs> I'd impress myself. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's really what counts in the uh, car world. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a lot of money, and you could probably solve the uh, world hunger in a small nation somewhere for the purchase of that car. But Electric says that Tesla is now earning eight times more per car than Toyota. And Toyota is basically one of the world's largest automakers. And uh, they're starting to apparently notice back in Japan, according to Electric. For example, Tesla reported $3.3 billion in net profit last quarter, compared to Toyota earning just $434 billion, uh, yen. or less than half a billion yen, um, or roughly $3, three billion. So yeah, Tesla, th this is despite Tes you know Toyota delivering eight times more cars than Tesla yeah. in the same time period. And Tesla and beat them on profits. That's kind of wild. It is. So, you know, they made the same money, the same profits, but, you know, wow. I mean, the demand for Tesla is high. There's this whole inflation thing going on. There's the supply problem, the chip shortages. So they have eked up their prices a little bit, a thousand here, a thousand there, and as a lot of people are. And, you know, they're, they're, they, what, what do you think it is? It's like a third of, uh, profit per car or something like that. It's it's really high. It's it's higher than most people. Yeah, I don't know, but um, no, it's uh, so. And of course, the milestone. Sorry, go ahead. The um, traditional automakers make more money on things like you know service and parts and stuff. So right. Um, but yeah. So this milestone of Tesla beating Toyota in earnings during a quarter is especially impressive when you consider that just a decade ago, Toyota owned 3% of Tesla with just a $50 million investment. Think of, you know, they get rid of that. Yeah. So now, now Tesla generates $50 million in free cash flow almost every day. Wow. Which is why the CEO can do kooky things and do whatever he wants. It's now time for the Tweet of the Week. Uh, this is where I highlight a tweet uh, that I like. Sometimes it's a good one. Sometimes there's a couple of good ones. Maybe I'll do two this week. From Jenny Chase, solar analyst with Bloomberg NEF, New Energy Finance. She says, the casual line from those hippies in Pakistan's National Electric Power Regulatory Authority. Authority. That is a mouthful. Let me say that again. It's a casual line from those hippies at Pakistan's National Electric Power Regulatory Authority. And this is basically what they said in their report. They said the existing average cost of 12 cents per kilowatt hour to supply electricity to end consumers is high, way too high. And one way to reduce this high cost is to procure cheap electricity from indigenous resources like wind and solar. Now, if we heard that from our utility in Canada... That would be remarkable, but uh -huh. this is coming from Pakistan, a very conservative place who is not um, known, especially in governmental uh, terms, to talk like this. But they see the value of this. You know, no no utility talks this way yeah. actually, but Pakistan uh -huh. is, and uh, because she lives in the solar space, she knows that nobody else is saying that. But Pakistan solar, uh, or pardon me, the electricity utility is saying that that we, one way that we're going to lower prices is by buying wind and solar. So good for them. Yeah, as we've said before, the fuel costs for wind and solar are zero. And now a secondary tweet of the week. Just because I wanted to do two. I, 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 and I hate deciding, Brian. It's, it's a lot of work to decide. Why should I have to decide? Uh, Fred Lambert, uh, Lambert, 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 Fred Lambert, editor-in-chief at Electric, he says, uh, his personal account, he says, when I talk about Elon's feedback loop being hijacked by superfans, this is what I mean. And he has a story from the Mercury News in San Jose, California. And before I go on, I just want to say that uh, Fred is owns like five Teslas, <laughs> has been a uh, the biggest fan of Tesla, and he's a journalist, but he's been reporting on Tesla forever. He is a enthusiast, a um, 
he's cheering them on in every way. But Elon Musk uh, blocked him once a long time ago because he had something mildly critical to say. Yeah. And, and Elon couldn't just take that. So what Fred thinks is that um, Elon, you know, like Michael Jackson and other people, they have this feedback loop of everybody's constantly praising them. And this is a story from the San Jose um, newspaper that says that uh, this one guy who's a, like a dad um, – was tweeting him like 19 times a day or something. And Elon was often responding to him because of such praise. And, you know, the soft spoken super fan dad praised him for being fit, ripped and healthy and asked, Hey, Elon Musk, what's your secret? It sounds like almost a joke, you know, like a comedian might do that because it's the opposite of mm -hmm. true. He's not fit. He's not ripped. He's not healthy. You look at him and you, you see a guy who doesn't, he's like an IT guy who never gets an hour of sleep. You know, he's like, he looks like he's, hasn't had sleep in years and certainly not the healthy lifestyle and certainly no sun. And the world's richest man's response was, uh, how do I keep fit and healthy? The, uh, fasting and diabetic drug that promotes weight loss. So good for you. When you're rich, you get to have the diabetic drugs that promote weight loss. And fasting's not good. You know, sumo wrestlers fast. They don't eat until 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Really? Yep. Wow. Not to 1 p.m. in the afternoon. That is a CES fast fact for you. That's because they store more weight if they don't eat all day. They train their body to fast. See, when you're born in human history, back when we were in caves and such, you know, 10 years ago, um, if you didn't eat, your body would think it was a, a famine and it would um, store extra weight. It would just change. So like fat people like me uh, would survive in a zombie apocalypse, so my nutritionist tells me. Because we would need 20% less calories. Right. <laughs> because we're that more efficient. At it. Anyway, um, so we get a little bit of feedback here from the Twitter. It says, Clean Energy Pod, you guys are talking about the future of hydrogen. So check out this podcast. And what was it? It says, this guy's uh, super anti-hydrogen and has some great points. And this is from Nelson. The podcast was... Our friend, Markham Hislop at Energy Talk Show. He has a podcast as well, occasionally puts out. Yet a guest, Paul Martin, a chemical engineer with a 30-year history of working with hydrogen and a member of the Hydrogen Science Coalition. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you want to hear some smack talk on hydrogen. And coming up in the show is the lightning round. So we'll zoom through the rest of the week's headlines in a fast fashion. Um, you know, we like to hear from you. It's really what we live on. Brian doesn't get up in the morning without the hope of somebody contacting us. Clean Energy Show at gmail.com. We're on TikTok and Instagram and everywhere else, Clean Energy Pond. We're on uh, Mastodon at clean at mastodon.energy. We're on YouTube, Clean Energy Show. Speakpipe, you can leave us an online voicemail message. Speakpipe.com slash clean energy show. And that sound means it is time for the lightning round where we'll end the show this way. A fast-paced look at the week in clean energy and climate news. Canada is putting the brake on China's $4 billion lithium acquisition free. China is here buying up all the lithium they can. And Canada has finally said no. Uh, so Chinese companies have been the biggest financiers of overseas lithium projects globally in recent years, including purchases of Canadian-listed assets. And that is a new development. Yeah, Brian. so this is new legislation that limits the foreign ownership of some of these critical minerals that we're going to need for the uh, electric revolution. Call it the Biden approach, saying no more China. Uh, the Charging Interface Initiative, a global industry association focused on the electrification of transportation, has launched its new megawatt charging system, MCS it's going to be called. We have CCS, the non-Tesla standard for charging connectors. This is going to be MCS, so memorize that term, Brian. Okay. MCS is the new megawatt charging system standard for North America. So this will be some specific kind of plug and protocol for how to charge at even higher speeds. Megawatt speeds for trucks, yep. basically for trucks, big trucks, you know, not necessarily, not necessarily all semi uh, transport trucks, but uh, medium trucks as well. Um, you know, this is interesting. The 2023 Kia EV6 base trim has been dropped and the starting price that means has jumped to an unfortunate $50,000 US. 
That means, Brian, I can't afford it. Yeah, that's too bad. I mean, we sometimes, too, get different trim levels here in Canada, so we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. But 50000 is a lot. Ah, another CS fast fact. The golden toad is the first species to go extinct due to climate change. Put that in your toaster and smoke it. It's uh, too warm for them, I guess. Yep. Ugh. The toad has had enough. Uh, Panasonic has broken ground on their EV battery factory in Kansas. This is what we referred to early, or red states getting uh, a lot of this EV, ma EV manufacturing, green tech manufacturing yeah. and jobs. And they'll be making 2170 cylindrical cells. A Viking bus orders 31 Mercedes-Benz e Citero buses as long distance runners in the uh, country. Known as Denmark. Hello, Denmark. Uh, 588 kilowatt hour batteries will cover long distances of up to 500 kilometers or 310 miles. Uh, the reason I bring that up is because we've mentioned this before. When will long distance city to city buses electrify? Well, the answer is I guess it's starting. That's great. The market share of zero emission light duty vehicle registrations in Canada hit 9.4% in the third quarter of this year, and that's a new record. Um, it's up from any previous record, which is shows that the, you know, EV adoption is accelerating in Canada. Yeah. We're definitely past some sort of a tipping point, which is often said to be around 5% of the market. So yeah, Canada at 9.4% EVs. That's fantastic. How many Ford Mustang electrics do you see around? I see them almost every day now. Yeah, there's definitely. Maybe it's the same guy in my neighborhood. I don't know, <laughs> but I see them everywhere in the North end. Uh, one in six EVs sold in Europe will be made by Chinese makers of EVs by 2025, Fitch Solutions says, according to the China EV Post. So that's interesting. Something we've been following since the early days of this podcast is when will Chinese EV makers start to make gains in uh, Western markets? And, yeah, and I know, guess Europe first because it's uh, closer. It's always Europe first, isn't it? Yeah. Because, you know, they've, they need their EVs over it's, there. It's physically closer and they have tougher regulations to kind of phase out combustion. A slight majority of California voters favor the recently announced ban on new sales of gasoline-powered vehicles by 2035. It's only 52% uh, and 43% disapprove. But hopefully they'll come around when prices do, you know. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to complain if the range and price is there. No. And no. charging infrastructure. 2035 is a long way away, so that number will change. Yeah. Oh, another fast fact. Air conditioners and heating elements consume 50% of electricity in America. Did you know that? No, that's a lot. That's a lot. Analysis, as seen by the BBC, shows that the production and transport of LNG causes up to 10 times the carbon emissions compared to pipeline gas. So build more pipeline. I'm kidding. Yeah, so LNG. That's, that's a refrain we hear around here. Liquid natural gas as opposed to actual gas that goes through pipes. So... Uh, the greater than 8% electricity from a uh, solar club in Europe for 2021, here's the countries that have 8% or more just from solar. Germany, Spain, Greece, Italy, Netherlands. Not bad. And there's a whole bunch at 5%, a whole whack at 5%. And good for you, Greece, by the way. I don't always think of Greece as a leader in uh, clean energy, but, um, you know, these things, they sneak up on you. Amazon is meeting holiday demand this year with a fleet of over a thousand Rivian electric vehicle delivery vans. So we were talking about those for a long time now, and I guess there's a thousand of them on the roads for Christmas this year. Yeah, that's not bad. Wish we had one. And um, Amazon has... Let's just hope it's 10,000 next year and 50,000 the year after that or something. Yeah, they've, they've definitely ordered more than that. Amazon's a big investor in Rivian, and they're desperately trying to scale up their production of these vans and their pickup trucks. So uh, hopefully things speed up nicely. And finally this week, uh, Tony Siba says in a post that, uh, speaking of Amazon, Amazon created a vast information technology infrastructure, but they used it just five weeks of the year, the holiday shopping season, which is Christmas in November and December, uh, where we live. Uh, they overbuilt capacity for the rest of the year. And, you know, he says, well, let's call that super data center. And thus the... Uh, Amazon uh, AWS Cloud was born, which you see advertised on TV. It's now a trillion-dollar business because they overbuilt something. So the reason he mentions that, Brian, is why? 
because this is what's going to happen to solar, wind, and batteries. Because solar is intermittent, wind is intermittent, we need to overbuild it. But because these technologies are so cheap and getting cheaper, we can easily overbuild it. So Amazon, of course, you know, a large amount of shopping happens in November and December, the Christmas shopping season here in Canada and the U.S. So, you know, they had to really beef up their online system to handle all these transactions in December. And what did they end up with? Uh, Amazon Web Services, which is now a trillion dollar business, apparently. Yeah, it's a lot of money just for overbuilding something because, yeah, and that's what's going to happen with the energy markets because we're going to have extra solar, extra wind around. That is our show for this week. Um, you know what? Next year, we're going to have a Patreon. If you have any ideas for the Patreon, let us know what kind of perks you might be interested in. And by God, write us. Write us right now. Show at gmail.com or Clean Energy Pod everywhere on social media. If you're new to the show, remember to subscribe to our a show on your podcast app to get new shows, new episodes delivered every week. We'll see you next time. See you next week.